All right. Works in the holographic theory of mind, part 48, on hot theory, or higher order thought, theory of consciousness, or the idea that concepts are required for consciousness, and that somehow this notion of concepts and their need for consciousness also solves, solves the hard problem. So yes, this is a discussion in a philosophical vein, but it's also a very bad misunderstanding. That is of what a concept is, of what thought is, and it comes from a deeply ingrained philosophical illness, but it has followers. And so it's worth looking at. So hot theory, higher order thought theory, it is proffered as a solution to the hard problem. And it too, as usual, has no understanding of the hard problem. Its main proponents, I have a question mark there because I'm not sure I have all, them all, but these four seem to be the main ones. William Lincoln, D David Rosenthal, Peter Carruthers, Rocco Gennaro. There are also heavies that have taken shots at it, like Ned Block, David Chalmers, Roland, Levine, Dretzky. No hot discussion to me comprises one of those dissatisfying, disappointing, disconnected discussions in the philosophy of mind. It's hard to deal with, hard to read, hard to suffer through. It's disconnected somehow, somehow deeply from the actual realms of cognition, perception, and memory from the concrete. It's working with the menagerie, a veritable zoo of philosophical terms, beliefs, intentionality, dispositions, mental states that really do little to help and are not particularly necessary, but philosophy seems to think this is the real tools for thinking about consciousness. But at base, it's a really bad misconception of mind and being. By the way, speaking of a disconnection, I've been listening recently to Carl Friston, who is a much, much bigger name in the world of brain theory than I realized, thanks now to a correspondent, this is largely in the context of the predictive processing framework, which we looked at in number 14, though he's also related to embodied, embedded, and active, which we also, which we looked at in number 15. So in the predictive processing framework, we mostly looked at Howey's work, but one of Howey's prime sources was Friston. And one of the things, one of the disconnects is from the actual structure of events of all those invariance laws of Gibson describing stirring coffee over time, dynamically changing event of coffee stirring. And we'll have to re revisit it again in this context also. I noticed how related hot is to the predictive processing framework, where in that framework, an hypothesis say of, about what's going on in the external world, say coffee stirring, a prediction is projected down neural pathways and the input is literally suppressed. Effectively, the hypothesis becoming the perception that is the image of the external coffee stirring. Now, spoiler, we're going, we'll see hot projecting concepts effectively downwards into neural activity. These two theories are very much related, and, and number 14 is actually going to apply to HOT, just so you know. And the source of the many illnesses in both frameworks is going to be very much the same. HOT does not have much of a following, yet it was one of three, three, three theories mentioned as a possible player in a proposed neuroscience test slash prediction playoff, that is whose predictions would work the best for a theory of consciousness. The other being integrated information theory of consciousness and the global workspace theory, GWT, then along with HOT. This was startling to me. It means that this weak theory is given some degree of credibility. How, thought I, is this possible? To me, the basic errors at HOT's heart are so obvious, so fundamental, that there should be not even a doubt as to its status. That is, shall we say, really low. But this misconception, the misconception at his base is not obvious to philosophy. There is a very simple essence to Hot. But first, Hot is basically, basically a mind-brain identity theory. That is, the brain entirely accounts for consciousness, or brain, brain activity equals consciousness or equals mind. The picture of the uh, 
field up there, the flowing field and the driving is entirely accounted for by the brain. For Rocco in his article, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, he says, of course, hot theorists, including myself, tend to be, an important little note, tend to be token identity materialist in the end. But we, we prefer to leave that empirical question for a separate second step reduction to be filled in later by brain science. So this is quite an out they've given themselves. They, they only tend to be token identity theorists and not materialists. They're not really such. They can leave that open. The problem is they have no other route. They have no other alternative. Ask in an interview if hot theory could uh, be implemented by an AI. He says, yes, I don't rule it out, but to what extent is the biology necessary? Here, here of course, he's echoing the standard dilemma conundrum of all philosophy as to what actual bi di dynamics, biodynamics of the brain might actually uh, provide. To go on, you can attribute knowledge, beliefs to robots, maybe not emotions. So he has no criteria for how to distinguish between AIs, robots, computer implement, implementations, and actual human minds. There's no basis there. So I would submit that you, you may as well treat them as identity theorists. But then, if, if when one do so, one does so, you'll see that very quickly it becomes quite absurd. On the other hand, the out that they're looking for, some theory that is uh, not brain mind identity, one that we know of, for example, would pull the rug completely out from under the theory, which we'll see. So the hot theorist claims to be solving the problem at the mental level. How the mental is realized physically and how to think it is, that's someone else's problem. That's Rocco's second step reduction in the quote above. The quote, I believe that the hot theory provides necessary and sufficient conditions for what makes a mental state conscious. But whatever realizes that theory in our brains is a separate empirical question. On the other hand, other theories of consciousness are reductionist in the stronger sense that they attempt to explain consciousness directly in physical or neurophysiological terms. That is, they're actually trying to figure out what the brain does. But they're exempting themselves from this uh, theoretical requirement. To continue quoting. But then, of course, the hard problem asks why or how exactly does the presence of such a hot result in a conscious mental state? The hard problem? Well, sort of, kind of. To quote, the solution then is that hots, higher order thoughts, explain how consciousness arises because the concepts that figure into the hots are presupposed in conscious experience. Continue, in very much a conscient, conscient spirit, the idea is that first, we passively receive information via our senses. Info comes, goes to the brain. This occurs in what Kant calls our faculty of sensibility, sensory systems. Some of this information will then arise to the level of unconscious mental states, our UMSs there, which of course also cause our behavior in various ways unconscious mental states causing behavior. But such mental states do not become conscious until the faculty of understanding operates on them via the application of concepts. So as soon as we get the concepts acting on the unconscious mental states, we get conscious mental states. And apparently, voila, we have the perception and experience of the coffee stirring. To quote, I contend that we should understand such concept application in terms of hots directed at, directed at the incoming information. So we have the hot with concept of coffee stirring apparently being directed at the information and that causes the uh, perception of coffee stirring. To continue, thus I consciously experienced the brown tree as a brown tree, partly because I apply the concepts brown and tree in my hots to the income, incoming information via my perceptual apparatus. More specifically, I have a hot such as I am seeing a brown tree now.
So I have this thought now apply to the information coming in and this causes the perception of the tree. Okay, the quote, it is crucial to remember that these hots are not themselves conscious. Thus, hots and their concepts are, we might say, presupposed in conscious experience. The understanding unconsciously synthesizes the raw data of experience. Hmm, okay. He notes even non-conscious mental states also involve some form of conceptualization or categorization insofar as they have intentional content. So the um, state intentional concept or con content being the perception of the brown cow, well, we have to have that uh, brown cow thought. That's intentional content. However, part of the motivation for the hot theory is to explain when and how a non-conscious state becomes conscious important, how a non-conscious state becomes conscious. And the answer on the hot theory is that the subject becomes aware of the state, that is, has a hot directed at it. Again, we direct the hot at the, at the uh, unconscious mental state, becomes a conscious mental state, which then becomes the intentional content of the reception of the brown cow. So it is not just concepts, it is hots, which include concepts, directed at the mental state, which and also already has concepts of which the subject, quote, becomes aware, quote unquote. So what is the operative thingy? A hot with a concept forces a unconscious mental state into awareness, quote unquote. A hot has power to force awareness. To quote, a hot theorist will therefore argue that a purely first order neural based a kind of consciousness cannot adequately explain the difference between non-conscious and, and, and conscious mental states. Hence, the concepts in question must be in the hots, and they are responsible for the what it is like nature of qualitative experience. So, the hard problem is solved because we're accounting for the what it is like nature of qualitative experience. So what we have is these unconscious mental states, they're in the brain, they're in neural flows, but somehow they look like this, the brown cow, via a hot, which has the power to do this. But a hot too is neural flows. Remember, it's a mind-brain identity theory. Hmm. Yes, some ma strange magic has occurred to these neural flows that are also hots. Now, note to certain people, for example, my discussant on uh, the Castro number 41, I think it was, that uh, when I said that Castro had um, supposedly solved the hard problem, I'm joking. There's no solution to the hard problem. So, Gennaro. Rosenthal's notion. Remove one, each concept one by one from an experience. There'll be no experience left. So an interesting idea, we'll, we'll come back to this, but he goes on. He lays out Hott's ultimate defensive redoubt, the castle mental, to quote. Some will ask a further question. Why does the higher order application of concepts give rise to conscious experience? But this, I, su I suggest, is not a legitimate question we have already reached the rock bottom brute fact about the way that conscious minds work and the chain of explanation has already come to an end. Again, holding up in this castle, to quote, this solution is unlike reductionist accounts in non-mentalistic terms. And so it is immune from Chalmers criticism. For example, there is no problem about how some specific brain activity produces conscious experience. Chalmers criticism that functional explanations are inadequate because one could always ask, why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? I, why simply moving bits around in a computer memory or in a neural net produce anything at all in the way of conscious experience? This is equally beside the point. But, but hottest are mind-brain identity theorists. 
Okay, he says, they tend to be mind-brain identity theorists, as Rocco says, but essentially this is just a dodge. They have uh, no other root. The mental is just the neural, just brain activity. Remember, they cannot differentiate when, robot, when uh, Rocco was asked between robots and computers. Yeah. Robots, computers, and the brain. That is simple manipulation of bits versus neural flows versus neural net bit manipulation. Same difference. They have no other basis. They have to be mind-brain identity theorists. But this is the end of the essence. Now, Carruthers warns us, most critiques only apply to one version or flavor of hot, because there's lots of flavors. His list, HOP, higher order perception, of first order perceptions, those neural-based thingies, hot actual and mental state has object of a hot, hot cause non-inferentially, hot dispositional, a mental state that is simply available to cause a hot, and self-representational, a mental state with a higher order intentional content, thereby representing itself to the person subject to that state. You see what I meant about the zoo. Sorry, the flavor is going to be irrelevant. Hot, whatever the flavor, does not understand the hard problem. Hot does not, under not understand what a concept is or what a thought is. Or for that matter, as far as I have seen, have any of Hot's critics, including all those people I noted that uh, sent tanks and helicopters at it. The Hot folks are getting away with so many things. In just a few paragraphs we've looked at, it's somewhat like you know, shooting ducks in the gallery. So we begin with the most glaring. As noted in this series over and over, the hard problem is not this, as Rocco said, how X produces a conscious mental state, but this, the origin of the image of the external world, the coffee cup, spoon stirring, etc. This is the privilege problem and the problem of consciousness. Without a solution, your theory is useless because this is a mental state. It is phenomenal experience. It is in this image. The origin of the image incorporates it all. The image is entirely qualitative. It has qualities of color, of dynamic forms, of motion over time. For there are qualities defined only over time. In fact, all qualities defined over, only over time. A fact ignored by all quality discussion. So for me, when I say Berks's model explains the origin of the image, thus the hard problem, well, to the hottest, it's like, well, what are you talking about? They don't understand this at all in terms of the origin of the image of the external world, not realizing that this statement covers everything they're looking for, all of the quality of dynamic forms, etc. And did I mention it is a mental state? Watching that coffee cup being stirred is a mental state and stirring it. So how in the heck does a hot with a concept produce this image? What is a hot with a concept such that it can be applied to the neural flows and bring about an image? Now, I chose hot with concept here because it's this composite that seems operative, not just concepts in the thought is both conscious and unconscious mental states of conscious, or is it awareness driven by the hot? I mean, there's some ambiguity here, I'm not sure. Note two, this covertly implies a theory of memory, of redintegration, as we talked about number four. How does the pattern in the neural flow retrieve that hot slash concept, which is in fact, a memory of coffee stirring or invariance across coffee stirring. How is that done? Well, I guarantee you there's no theory about this in, in the hot world. But that's something we won't go into here, but certainly we could. There is, of course, absolute silence on this. They have never seen this put this way as a problem. They are only pointed at this, that they're hot with a concept makes a mental state conscious. Where conscious mental state presupposes 
the entire phenomenology of experience, the colors, forms, motion, forces, experience, the coffee stirring. And this is already their final redoubt. All this phenomenal stuff is someone else's problem. Those lowly first order neural based theory guys. Us hottest have the really important role. We show how all this becomes conscious. Yep, via concepts. Oh, and this solves the hard problem. So, a theory that provides a neural brain based, or as the hottest say, first order model of this the coffee stirring with all its qualities of color, motion, sounds, forces, and also providing a theory of the memory supporting its specification as a time extended continuity in the past, because we're always seeing the past, this still does not solve the hard problem? I was unaware of the depth of this absurdity in hot until I reread this literature. And then this thought crept in. What would Hotta say of Bergson? In my opinion, this. That is a cute theory of perception, Mr. Bergson, but merely a first order theory. So of course, it is sadly lacking and does not solve the hard problem. For that, given your deficient understanding, you need us and our model of HOTS with concepts which make mental states conscious. A good try, well, maybe not even that. Right. Let's deal with this. So for any hot theory people that have been attracted out of the blue to this vid, allow me to re-describe briefly the structure of Bergson's theory on perception. It begins, as we know, with the fact that Bergson envisioned the universe as a holographic field. In matter and memory, he had noted that there's no possibility that there is a photograph of the external world of the coffee cup, for example, developed, developed in the brain, but rather that the photograph is already developed in the very heart of things and at all points of space. This was a statement that the universal field is a holographic field, just as Bohm stated in 1980, much later. The brain, as opposed to Bohm, Bergson saw as an essence a modulated reconstructive wave passing through this holographic field and specific to a portion of the field. In the little red box up in the right there, we have the standard holographic reconstruction process where we have a reconstructing wave set defined, we'll say, by frequency one passing through that holographic plate, which is a massive interference pattern, just like the universal field would be. And it's picking out of that interference pattern, a specific wave front associated with frequency one. Originally, in this case, an object wave from the cube and passing through that plate, the original wave front from the cube is specified to the eye of the observer. I can modulate that reconstructive wave, say to frequency two. Now I'm picking out information from the interference pattern related to frequency two, in this case, the object wave from a cup that now being specified to the eye of the viewer. Modulate to frequency three. I'm now picking out information related to frequency three, in this case, the object wave from a wine glass now specified to the, to the observer. And then modulate it back again to frequency one and we're back to the cube. So that's the essence of modulating the reconstructive wave. That's the idea behind it. So by this process, and this process being that the brain is creating, supporting a modulated reconstructive wave passing through this holographic field, then the portion of the field that is being processed is specified as an image. And that image is within the field, right where it says it is in the external field, external to us on the kitchen table. It is not generated by the brain or within the brain or generated by the brain you now in some mental sphere, uh, which the hot people would say, but which is extremely problematic, what mental actually is to the, to the hot theory. And I want to note 
this reconstructive wave is very concrete, as concrete as an AC motor. We need the concrete wave, as concrete as that light wave passing through the holographic um, plate in the red box, equally so. This is a very complex but very concrete modulation pattern, and we'll see more what this involves in a bit. Now, this holofield is transforming dynamically, continuously in time. This transformation cannot be described as a series of discrete states or, dis or discrete instants of time. This is the classic metaphysic. Rather, this transformation must be seen as indivisible, as Bergson argued, or non-differentiable. Better to look at it like a melody where the states or notes in time meld into, permeate each other like an organic whole or organic continuity. This is the essence of his temporal metaphysic. As such, the field transformation, this transforming holographic field carries an elementary property of memory, elementary property. That is, there are no instants, discrete instants falling successively into the past into, or into the non-existence symbolized by the past, present by present by present falling into the past. The indivisible transformation uh, avoids this. The specification then the specification of the reconstructive wave can be and is then to a past time extent of the field's transformation. All, everything we're seeing is the past, the past of the stirring spoon, the past of the buzzing fly. Now inherent in all of the above, then, with this nature of this holographic field, is that due, this, due to its indivisibility, it is a qualitative field. The energy state of the brain determines the scale of time at which the field is specified. There's an infinity of possible scales of time. The energy state is denoting that underlying the process velocity, the chemical velocities supporting processes in the brain. There could be, for example, a fly buzzing by the cup at normal scale, scale of time. It's a buzzing fly, wings a blur at 200 beats per second but it could be specified as a heron-like fly, barely flapping his wings, or at a very tiny scale of time, as an ensemble of electrons, an electron cloud. At the null scale of time, the infinitely small, most minute imaginable scale of time, the whole of field has an elementary awareness defined over it. This is due to the fact that the state of each point holographically reflects the state of the whole. Thus, there is an elementary awareness of the whole at each point, shall we say. And each point simultaneously is reflecting the history of the whole, of this, the whole transformation of the field. That is, there's an elementary memory. The, the indivisible transformation of the field carries an elementary memory. So there's an elementary awareness and memory defined over the field. This is not the awareness of buzzing flies, heron-like flies, or even electrons. But as such, the specification is to a time-scaled form of this elementary awareness, that is, buzzing flies or heron-like flies. And it's from a spatial perspective, this perspective of our, of our guy there. There's no true spatial separation within this field. At, again, a small enough scale of time, the fly is an ensemble of electrons, an electron cloud, but so is the body. There's no true sp spatial separation between body and fly. In Bergson's principle, subject differentiates from object then, not in terms of space, but of time. As we apply successively larger scales, as we apply successively, large, successively larger scales, the electron cloud transforms from a, to a heron-like fly to a buzzing-like fly of normal scale, and the body itself is equally specified to perception. This is the great subject and object principle of Bergson. All of this is, in essence, removing the homunculus, the observer in our picture up there. There's simply the specification of a time-scaled form of awareness defined across the field. So now we ask, do this theory of conscious perception, 
where we have the reconstructive wave specification of, of the dynamically transforming time extended image of the external world at a scale of time, what can hot theory contribute? Nothing. Does it add something to the relation of subject and object? Hot doesn't even seem to know this is a problem. To the time scale specific quality of the image? Say what? It doesn't even know the time scales are an aspect of quality. To the memory problem in time extended event perception, that is how we perceive an extended event, which would require some form of memory. Say what? As far as hot goes, it's not even a problem. But the hot theorist will say, but, 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 we have to add the concepts. We must add the concepts. So the baby opens his eyes. There is the image of the external world. Objects are in motion, bottles, mothers, tables transforming. There are no concepts yet. No bottles, no tables, no mom. Yet this dynamically changing image, is it not the conscious perceptual experience of the infant? That is to say, in the Bricksonian framework, do we not have an automatic time-scaled specification of the awareness intrinsic to the holographic field from a spatial perspective, namely that of the babies? But the hottest will insist somehow that concepts are necessary, whether from some set of innate concepts, which he will never be able to define or delineate the origin thereof, or something concepts to make that mental state conscious, though it already is conscious. Okay, let's deal with this anyhow. We've seen this. The brain is a reconstructive wave. It's modulation pattern driven by the invariant structure of the dynamic event. This structure forms the basis for the concept of coffee stirring. That invariant structure, as we've noted many times, velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, that is ratios of frequency of oscillation to energy of oscillation, inertial tensors, haptic carried in the haptic flow fields, acoustic invariance, texture gradients, ratios, flows, all this defining the coffee stirring event. Stack enough coffee stirring events in 4D memory. Then drive a similarly structured wave to the stack. The invariance across these concrete events is equivalent to equals a concept, coffee stirring. But without these concrete events, the invariance does not, cannot exist. The abstract cannot exist without the concrete. So how is this invariance structure separated or severed? Separated, cut that arrow there from the events phenomenal structure. How can it be independent? How an abstract disembodied concept divorced from the concrete experiences of coffee stirring? Well, it's easy if you've never considered the existence of an invariant structure defining it in the first place, which of course is what hottest never think about. How can it be separate? The radio flow field intrinsic to the phenomenal swirling the adiabatic invariance, intrinsic to the feel of stirring. The inertial tensor, intrinsic to the wielding of the spoon. A concept cannot be separated from the phenomenal. It is not an independent abstraction. But per Gennaro, and I note he says this in the context of saying, well, we really don't know what concepts are, but here I'll give it a, a brief explanation. And he says, quote, concepts are perhaps best understood as universals which fix the extension of terms. Of course, I'm asking, but, but concepts are the essence, the absolute essence of hot theory. If we don't know what concepts are, one would think we have to get to it. But in any case, he's essentially saying something like this. This is the extension in terms of extension of terms of mellow. That is, it's not just a semantic network or data structure like thing. Again, where we have pure symbols or symbols linked to symbols. The essence of abstraction, the typical abstraction to abstraction, safely divorced from the concrete. This may seem to confer some mystical power, 
but seen as an invariance over the phenomenal and requiring a 4D memory. There's nothing about a concept that can bring about consciousness. Concept application to mental states is meaningless, particularly when the conscious perception, the specification of the, of the portion of the field, the coffee cup that's stirring, and a time extent of its transformation at a scale of time, this image is already, wait for it, a conscious mental state. Yet ultimately, this state is suffused with concepts. Yes, ultimately. But these are sourced in the very structure that drives the modulation, the invariant structure. Okay, let's add in thought, as in higher order thought with concepts. A thought, say, of coffee stirring, is clearly a function of previous perceptions. It is based in concrete, concrete experience, on 4D experience. Thought is a function of the virtual. Even abstract thought is based in this. Remember Piaget's operations. Remember the semi-rotations of a tunnel where we, where we learn the odd even rule. An odd number of uh, rotations changes the order. An even number of semi-rotations keeps the, preserves the order. But these were all images of the action of, of rotating the tunnel a string of images of rotating the tunnel once, then twice, then three times, and they're ultimately rendered flexible, reversible, but at their base still dynamic images, even of this form of thought. Given Hot has no theory of perception, its attempt to use thought that is hot with concepts is useless. It is simply assuming a theory of perception, which virtually by definition it can never have, because Hot starts with thought but perception is the material for thought. This is a fundamental inversion. So return to that hot redoubt, the castle mental. What is the mental to the hottest? I have no idea. It is certainly not the phenomenal, not the image of the external world, not the memory of those images, not the dynamic use of those images. It certainly appears to be computer code slash computer processing such neural activity, the abstract symbol manipulation supposed in these neural networks. Rocco, we saw, affirmed the robots can have knowledge, beliefs, that is equally thoughts, cognition. But this is not possible because robots cannot have images or concrete experience on which to base thoughts. In this, we saw Hot's misconception already operative. Put this another way. This is the abstraction sickness of AI. As though the abstract can exist without the concrete, without the dynamic image, without perception. But you cannot divorce the abstract from the concrete, from concrete experience. There is no such thing as an abstract bending that we can represent in a computer memory or a neural net. You have pure symbols. Something is always being bent, a bow, a body, an elbow, a spoon, or the truth over various experiences of truth telling or not. Bending exists only as an invariance defined over concrete experiences. And we can put bending in our 4D memory too. And of course, it'll have a different invariance structure, different floor, flow field, structure forces, different acoustics. This is why concepts require a device whose memory is 4D, time extended virtual, because you need all that time extended flow over which invariance can be defined, and multimodal, that is optical, sonic, kinesthetic. You need a multimodal time extended memory, exactly what an AI memory, what a computer memory, even what a neural memory is not. So again, as though the abstract can exist without the concrete, which is to say, as though the mental can actually exist without the phenomenal. For the hot folks, yes, thought folks, this is their disconnection from the actual subject of cognition, from the literature. Folks like Mark Johnson, Lakoff, for whom even the most abstract aspects in language are based in metaphor, ultimately in concrete images, in bodily metaphors, or Piaget, Wertheimer, Gibson, as we saw, 
they, the hot theorists, have never taken these kinds of lessons to heart. It's a case of abstraction sickness that plagues philosophy. So Hot's concepts, abstract, unreal, non-existent entities, divorced from the concrete, from concrete experience, becoming pure symbols, coffee stirring, at core creatures of the classic metaphysic, which we've gone through before. The abstract, homogeneous, 4D space of points, positions, where motion is treated as point to point, instant to instant. It's infinitely divisible into ever smaller points and instants. So each instant then corresponds to an instantaneous cube, shall we say, of the all of space. An utterly, utterly homogeneous cube because it's been stripped of all qualities and it is has a time extent of virtually nothing, zero. So this, of course, is an infinite regress because between each pair of points, you have to reintroduce the motion. So yes, this is Zeno's critique. So time is just the fourth dimension of this abstract space or continuum of points positions as instants. We can take each of those cubes of space and stack them all together as a giant 4D structure. This abstract space or metaphysic underlies hot and its concepts as pure abstractions. This metaphysic is a completely unexamined, hidden foundation of the hot world. Even for any notion they likely have, that experience is stored in the brain because each of those instants disappears as the next one arrives. Each position disappears as the next position arrives of that airplane. And so we have to store that experience that's just been lost in the brain, the brain being matter, being always present. So this then begins the whole process, the problem of concepts. These concepts, as we saw, are given mystical powers of application to neural activity, when if they stick to their idea that they're generally materialist, mind-brain identity theory, then they're only, it's only equally neural activity. So concepts being only in neural activity being applied to neural activity. In an AI, the, the hot is simply more computer code. And as we saw with Rocco, he has no in principle way to distinguish between computers and brains. For the perceptual image, for the very basis of the mental, we need concrete dynamics, the reconstructive wave. Yes, the concrete dynamics brought via the biology, whose function Rocco and everyone, as we've seen, is unsure of, except Bergson who gives meaning to why a concrete dynamics embodied in biology is necessary, not abstract computer manipulations or neural nets. But once you have a model of the origin of the image of the external world, you have the origin of the mental. And then for hot, the shooting is already over. So for closure, particularly for those who have been watching this series, I want you to acknowledge an intuition that is behind hot, the hot theorist, something they're expressing. And one sees this in Bergson, that is two forms of recognition that he described. The first was an automatic recognition, that is a feeling of familiarity created by a motor accompaniment where that motor accompaniment is formed over time and now has become automatic. I use the example of walking down the driveway to the barn this is a form of flow field, and as one walks, the flow occurs. And over time, one gains a neural accompaniment that uh, one feels, and this supports the familiarity. Attentive recognition, the second form, is a circuit. Here we have the virtual flooding into the present perception, filling in, amplifying detail. So, we have a guy there perceiving the coffee stirring. The coffee stirring is creating the resonance through all the virtual experiences of coffee stirring that he's experienced. And we're getting circuit back. So 
so to speak, a, uh, it's not truly a projection out in space, but a, but a specification in the field of vis-a-vis -vis former experiences of the details in that uh, coffee stream, in that event, amplification thereof. This is discussed heavily in number 31 on language. This reflects an intuition then that concepts, the past, are indeed an important component in conscious perception. But this requires all the Bricksonian structure, the virtual, the indivisible motion, the indivisibility of the motion of the universal field, the, the relation of subject and object, the reconstructive wave specification, the temporal metaphysic itself, all that hot does not have. But in a not concession, with respect to concepts and what they are, we've only touched on the full nature and problem of concepts. I hit some of this in number 41 on Bernardo Castrop and psychedelics and the nature of concepts. Quoting from Bergson, the same psychic life must be put, supposed to be repeated an endless number of times on different stories of memory. In the effort of attention, the mind is always concerned in its entirety. Notice, the mind is always concerned in its entirety. There are no parts, no things to associate in mind. It's one seamless whole. But it simplifies or complicates itself according to the level at which it chooses to work. So seeing a canoe or hearing the word canoe, a little guy sees the canoe there, the canoe is enveloped by, as Bergson says, ever-widening systems with which it is, it is bound up. As for example, just the perception of the canoe, but in a larger level, maybe remembering a particular act of canoeing, or see there might be something in, in more detail yet in that in that event. And and D, we've got all of our canoe trips, all of our experience with canoes, all flooding in to that perception or that uh, sentence that's heard about the canoe. Another view that Bergson gave with this cone, again at S, S is the uh, plane, the material plane, and the body is precisely inserted in that plane, and the present perception of the canoe represents a certain sensory motor equilibrium between the mind and the physical plane. At AB, at the top level of that plane, over AB is the entirety of our recollections, every experience of canoes, of canoeing. But a concept, as Bergson noted again, from this perspective, S, it's a bodily attitude, an uttered word, canoe. Or, as in the representation I've been using, the word book is an invariance across all of these. That is, there's an anchoring in the, in the uh, neural plane at S for, as I'd like to say, a wave going across that memory of all these experiences of, of reading books. But at AB, we have the thousand, to quote Bergson, individual images into which this its fragile unity would break up. So the concept in Bergson's term is this traverse. It's traverse from the material plane from S through the virtual and taking those that, that entire cone at various levels of detail. And this is why concept theory is so problematic and no mechanical theory is going to work. So a concept is a perceptual experience-based reality in the virtual, but something hot does not come close to. So postscript, I noted in number 38 that the proposed playoff in consciousness theories mentioned was IITC, HOT, GWT, Global Workspace Theory, Unmentioned, ORC, OR, and Hoffman's User Interface Theory would probably make the list. We've hit four of these, Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness, HOT, ORC, OR, Hoffman's UIT. None, as we have seen, is, it, is in actuality a theory of consciousness. None understands or has a solution to the hard problem. None has a theory of perception. Bergson's theory 
might be called speculative because it's holographic, but it's coherent. It's not filled with unexamined metaphysical assumptions operating, namely the classic metaphysic operating beneath the scenes, un 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 unanalyzed. It's not littered with logical inconsistencies. It's actually treating time, subject, object, memory as critical, which we don't even see in hot. It's completely compatible with Gibson. Others, no. His theory is built explicitly on his temporal metaphysic, as we've noted, which for a hottest would be, say what? What are you even talking about? The worth of a playoff for these others, I find curious, doubtful. Is global workspace theory worth a look? It suffers all the same myopias. We'll see. So next, we'll see. Until then, signing off.